Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Manif's 2015 inside the Filmmaker Studio. Our guest this morning has been involved in the finance, sales and distribution of feature films for over 20 years. After graduating in law from University College London, Gareth Jones practiced as a corporate lawyer with a city firm, McFarlane's. He joined Handmade Films as an in-house lawyer in 1984 went on to head Handmade and subsequently became Managing Director of Alibi Films International, both international film sales, both international film sale companies. Gareth negotiated the corporate acquisition of Handmade Films by Paragon, a Canadian public company, and was instrumental in floating Alibi Communications, PLC, on AIM and sat on the main board. Gareth has exec produced dozens, but he, when we were speaking before, I think we've had the number of... 80 well, I've been involved with over 80 independent over films. 80 independent films. Gareth has exec produced, financed, packaged and sold international rights in dozens of successful independent feature films, including With Nail and I, Mona Lisa, How to Get Ahead in Advertising, Nuns on the Run, The Man with Rain in His Shoes, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, The Hard World, The Secretary, The Business, Mystics, Open Range, My Summer of Love and 4321. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gareth Jones. Thank you and welcome to Manif's very first, well, second now, Filmmaker Studio. This showcase has been designed to delve into the perils and lessons to learn all that is independent film. But before that, let's start at the beginning. Gareth, where were you born? I was born in Wimbledon, in Surrey. And where did you go to school? I went to school in Chessington. And how was that? Um, it was okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it was okay. <laughs> was it at school? Nothing special. Was it at school? I suppose, really, we, we spoke about this and we briefly touched on your career. But you, did you start being interested in films at school? I actually started being interested in films when I was doing my A-levels at Kingston College. Mm. And uh, I got a job um, as an usher at the ABC Kingston-upon-Thames. So when I was doing my A-level. So I spent two years, even I started there when I was underage to see 18 films, but still managed to get there. <laughs> and I uh, spent two years, and I think that's really where I firmed up my interest in films. So you went, then went from, well, you went from an usher, presumably then you went to become a liar. What, was the idea always to move into sort of the film world? Uh, no, what, what happened was I, um, after I did my A-levels, like a lot of people, um, it was a bit different back then, but I went on to university mm. and I thought if I'm going to university, and it was at a time when a, a lot less people went to university, um, and I wanted to do a degree that I thought might be useful, so I did a law degree. Mm. And after, when I did a law degree, I then went on to um, become a solicitor because I, you often go into either becoming a barrister or a solicitor, and I became a solicitor. Uh, but my first training job and my first job was in the city I was a maritime lawyer I was with a shipping law firm acting for Greeks mainly for in shipping matters and then I moved on to another law firm McFarlane's which was more of a corporate firm so I was a marine lawyer a corporate lawyer and I was a litigator so nothing to do with the entertainment business so when you first got that first job in the entertainment business were you excited? Was it sort of like the coming together of the two? You know, you, sp you spoke about your interest in films earlier. Yeah. Were you excited? Uh, certainly, I realised that being a corporate lawyer was not particularly the life I wanted to have. And I then got the opportunity to join Handmade Films um, as their in-house lawyer. And Handmade Films at the time were, had made two films. Uh, first of all, I should say it was owned by George Harrison of The Beatles and his business partner, Dennis O'Brien. And the company had started because they made Life of Brian, because the Pythons needed financial help to make Life of Brian when EMI dropped out. So they made Life of Brian, and the second film they made at Handmade was Time Bandits, both of which were very successful films. And I joined after they filmed, as so they were expanding their business, so they needed an in-house lawyer. And the first film I worked on was Mona Lisa the first screenplay I ever read. And I was, became involved really, my first job was involved in putting the business together, doing the financing, bringing bank loans and other investment in. But the, uh, it was a different time, this was in the 80s, uh, early 80s in the UK. And there were probably only three major film companies. There was Handmade Films, Palace, and Goldcrest. Um, 
both of which, Palace and Goldcrest, eventually uh, went out of business. But now there's a lot more film companies than there were then, but there were three principal film companies at the time. Very interesting. I uh, just um, to take it sort of now to what you do now as an exec producer. Mm. When you see a story that you'd like to work with, could you just take us through the process of sort of getting yeah. that into a film? Um, what what happened with my career is that at Handmade, I became more and more involved in selling the films. Um, and by selling the films, when you actually make a feature film, you have to sell it in all the different territories of the world. So you go to the major film markets to do so, which are Cannes, Toronto, the American film market in Los Angeles, and Berlin. So you literally take your film, screen them at these markets, and then buyers buy them for territory by territory. So I went from uh, being the lawyer to be involved in the business, then being involved in the business and selling the films, which means pitching movies to people, showing completed films, showing promos, and then selling them to buyers in France, Spain, Italy, all around the world. So I found I really enjoyed selling films. That's one thing I really enjoyed. And also crucial to everything to do with filmmaking is eventually that film has to be shown to an audience, has to be shown in a cinema, has to be shown to a television audience, whatever. So I, um, when I come at a story, when I first meet a producer or filmmakers, I'm always thinking about what's the end audience going to be. And for me, the end audience isn't just the person in the cinema or the person who's going to watch it on DVD or VOD. It's actually the person who's going to buy the film for a territory. Because what happens is when a buyer buys a film for, say, the United Kingdom or France, they tend to buy all the rights, cinema, DVD, VOD, television, all television. So they buy a bundle of rights for that territory. And when they buy a bundle of rights for that territory, they, in turn, have to think about how they're going to sell it to their audience. So if you're selling it to a South American distributor, how is that South American distributor going to sell it, in turn, to his audience throughout South America? So um, you can't necessarily tailor a film for every audience in the world, but there are certain general things you can make when you make your film, when you do write your screenplay, to make it more accessible to a, a wider audience. So I'm constantly, that's why I like to get involved at the screenplay stage, to try and identify some of the elements that might help to make the film eventually, when it's turned from screenplay to a film, from film then to be sold, if you've started off with a, a base idea and a base screenplay that's saleable to a wider audience or to a certain select audience you, d you identify, then you've got more chance of your film actually reaching an audience at the end of it. So would you say sort of that that's the ability to sell that to a wide genre is what, atta what attracts you to pictures and stories? Or yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, it, it, it tends to be that there's, there's, been a, a dr there's been a change over the years that uh, and you can see this by looking at what's on at your local cinema, there's been a movement between making very big blockbuster films and smaller films. The middle ground has gone away. There used to be a lot more dramatic films being made in American cinema and world cinema. And what's happened is that a lot of the audience for dramatic films now have migrated to television. So they watch HBO, Showtime, AMC, where the dramatic reach has increased, and it's increased worldwide. So you see, if you look back at the 70s and 80s in American cinema, there were a lot of um, Scorsese-type films, a lot of dramatic films being made, which would not be made as easily in today's environment. So when I work with independent filmmakers, because we, we're not making huge budget films, we have to identify something different, story elements, something attractive that might reach certain sectors of the audience. And that's why genre films tend to play well. Um, and genre means either uh, horror films or more psychological thriller films, science fiction films, films that can be identified by a sector or are interested in it. So, and the other good things about certain of these films is that they don't require a high level of known cast, because many, many times uh, 
filmmakers you get stuck. You've made, you've written a screenplay, you've put your elements together, and then you're trying to get an actor on board who's known to buyers. And all buyers are interested in is what's the film about and who's in it. So they ideally want to have a story they like, but with an actor who's well known and known to their audiences. But that's often beyond the reach of independent filmmakers, uh, particularly if you're making your first or second film, because it, the actors, the international stars are too expensive, but more importantly, often won't work with fledgling filmmakers. So a lot of the time, you're trying to find a, a genre film doesn't require necessarily star actors. You know, successful horror films, psychological thrillers, science fiction films are made without known stars, just good actors. And that's one of the ways people can find an entrance point into the market. Right, that's wonderful. But something that you, you mentioned there that genre is very important and it is something that attracts you to a story and whether you want to start work with that story. Is there anything, you know, when you, when, that puts you off a story, it makes you think, I don't want to work with that film? Um, I, I think that uh, some... I, I think films where not much happens <laughs> don't make a great read and they don't usually make great films, I would say. <laughs> so it's... And, and it doesn't have to be a lot of events happen as in action, mm. but a film's got to have a tone of voice, like a novel has a tone of voice. And if you can find that tone of voice and translate it into a narrative with interesting characters, then you've got a shot at making something that starts to appeal to people. And the other elements you have to balance is, is how much a film is going to cost, because with the advent of digital technology and um, uh, we're now able to film digitally, edit digitally, and distribute digitally, project into cinemas digitally. That has reduced the base cost of filmmaking. So you can make a film for tens of thousands of pounds, hundreds of thousands of pounds, rather than millions mm -hmm. of pounds. Where the big cost implication comes in is when you get well-known actors in, they not only require a fee, but they require the production to have a certain infrastructure, a certain um, cost base that a, means that the actor feels supported. More importantly, the actor's agent feels that they can put their client into this. Because so I, I did a film, uh, 4321, which was, you know, say a million and a half pound film, and I got Emma Roberts, the American actress, into it, but I had to do a whole deal around her and make sure that she was looked after and she had um, somebody come over with her and his whole infrastructure, which was completely out of the cost alignment of the other actors mm. in it who were British actors, very good actors, but not so established. So whenever you have starry names in, it builds up the cost, not only in their fee, but you have to make sure the production, the whole production starts to go up in cost. In terms of like the cost now, do you think like crowdfunding and things like that, you know, you see on the internet quite a lot, people will crowdsource fund, you know, their films. Do you think that could potentially absorb some of those costs? Yeah, I think um, the, uh, there was an instance of a, and I forget who it was, a well-known actor did make his film through crowdfunding. It was, I think it was Zach Braff. Zach Braff, And everyone indeed. was saying, you shouldn't do that because he's got millions. Yeah, exactly. He had a, he had a negative yeah. reaction because people said, why are you going out raising money from this source? You should be able to get it yourself. But uh, I'm not so sure about whether that's right or wrong. I think that for the problem with crowdfunding is a lot of the time it doesn't work. Mm. Um, and the reason Zach Braff was able to crowdfund is because he's Zach Braff. So yeah. people were attracted to his name. So... Again, I, I think there's even more need to have some star elements if you're going to crowdfund because if you just go out with a proposition and you try and raise money about the proposition without any elements that people find interesting, why should they put in their 10, 50, 100, 200 dollars? So I, I'm, I've not done a lot of crowdfunding. I've seen it, but it, and I've seen people attempt it, but often it seems that they don't reach their targets. So I think it's quite tough. I think you need some elements that put... And bear in mind, it's a, crowdfunding is undertaken by a lot of people. So how are you going to make yourself stand out? Again, Zach Braff did it because he was Zach Braff. 
Yeah, no, yeah. it's true. So is there anything, that you, any advice you'd give to anyone thinking of making an independent film in the UK? Yeah, I, I would, first of all, I mean, I was involved with um, Tori and Matthew's film, Two Down, and they came from a very sensible base. They, they said, well, we're going to write a story that is in itself contained, that is still cinematic, but we know will not cost a great deal of money to make. And then they managed to get actors involved, quality actors, but they kept their cost base low. So, and through that, they've got a feature film that's a very good feature film that's their calling card. So when they go to make their next film, which will have a bigger budget to get stars, they can show people that film. Mm. So um, it's the, a, lot, they all, a lot of people make short films. Now, I think there's no harm in making a short film, often a good thing to do, people can see it, but you don't want to get stuck into the rut of making short film after short film after short film. You have to show your ability to make a film with a long narrative, and because people cannot necessarily judge a lot of short films, but they can judge something of a lengthy narrative. Um, and I would also say to people, think about genre, Think about, um, uh, I think, a, drama a dramatic domestic film that you might see on television or you might see um, on uh, certain American channels and things like that. It's quite tough to pull off just a, a, a domestic, say, a dr domestic story. I mean, films like Still Alice, a really good movie, and it did find an audience, but it needed Julianne Moore mm. in the role. And so many of these. American dramatic films, they have high-powered actors working at a much lower fee than normal just because they like the material. So if you're trying to make an independent film in the UK, I would think about genre and th because a lot of films now, if they're going to make it to the cinema, the cinema release they get is a more limited release for an independent film. They have a limited cinema release for the reason of trying to drive the VOD sales. Right. DVD is still exists and it's still there in the UK and it's still surprisingly strong in America but it is segueing into vi video on demand and the other uh, digital access channels. So, but again, how buyers and distributors, if you're the guy who's uh, putting the film out of Filmflex or on Virgin Media, they love to have films that have got a theatrical release because there's no better um, profile and advertising for a cinema, f for a film, than being shown in the cinema. Because even if people don't go and see it or it's not on for long and they miss it, it's had the advertising that goes with the theatrical release, it's had the profiles, and most importantly, it's been reviewed. And only films that are shown in cinemas are reviewed by national newspapers. Mm -hmm. So once a film has garnered some reviews, and even if some of them are not so great, as long as you've got some moderate to decent reviews, again, that's something that's used to drive the DVD, the VOD, uh, all those other sales. Um, uh, and another thing you can do with your film is that if your movie's got roles, I'd always build in some roles for older, somewhat older established stars. Um, because you can put somebody like uh, Charles Dance or Scottish actor James Cosmo. These actors are, you, you can get them in for a week's work or a few days' work. You can put them in as part of the cast list and uh, buyers like Universal in the UK and other people like this, they love to see some of these names. So. You can have a younger actor who's not known but a great actor. You can employ him for the whole six weeks of your film, and it won't cost you a lot of money. But you can add value to your film by having two or three character actors. And the big thing now is to get anybody who's been in Game of Thrones. <laughs> anybody who's been in Game of Thrones is regarded as, oh, well, they were in Game of Thrones. And the good thing about Game of Thrones is because they kill off so many people. It's a high <laughs> turnover show. So you get. <laughs> get a lot of actors, um, people like Liam Cunningham, a lot of good Irish actors who come into the show, and now it's, it's added to their value. 
And because ultimately you have to remember that the parties buying the film, their safety net for sales is television. And they'd love to do TV deals. And there's, there's so many TV channels now. So if you've bought for Portugal, you've, you're buying it to put it out on VOD, then you're trying to get it out on the Portuguese pay channels, the Portuguese free channels. They love to have some name value. And a show like Game of Thrones, successful in those territories, there you've got an actor who suddenly people know. And there are a number of these actors, and I would, there's so much value in just getting one, two, or three of these older actors in. I know a guy who did a film, a gangstery film for a couple of hundred thousand pounds, about four, and he built it around four old, older guys who come back from Spain and get up to all sorts of things. But he managed to get in three or four character actors, and, it, and it, it was very successful, and he's made a sequel. So, again, he built it around the thought that I can get these guys in for a reasonable amount of money, I can make the film for £200,000, but there is a bit of a following for some of these guys. So that's, that's one, of the, one of the areas. Whatever your film is about, if you can bring in some older, established names for a few days, a week's work, it won't cost you so much money, and it's, it, it pays dividends. <laughs> Sorry, it's just when you said Charles Dance, I just thought of all those films that you see him pop up, and I'm like, that's why he was that's in why, it. That's why, that's why he was in that Dracula yeah, exactly. old stuff yeah, film. Yeah. Um, okay, well, you've been in charge of several. Uh, lost my word there. You've been in charge of several film sale companies. Could you explain how the sales agents work? Yeah. Um, what happens is that when you, you as a filmmaker, are financing your film. There's several stages at which you may have to involve sales companies. Um, if somebody is lending you the money or investing in the film, they want to get some perceived value of what the film is. So in order to do that, they um, need a sales agent or sales company. It's an interchangeable phrase. And a sales company is a company who go out in the marketplace to the CAN, AFM, or uh, Berlin and sell the films. They have a presence there, they have an office, they have a relationship with the buyers in all the territories of the world. And outside of the festivals, they're also selling films to these people. So often, if you're in the process of making a film, somebody says, I need a set of sales estimates from a sales agent. So a sales agent can be engaged at that stage to give you um, an estimate of highs and lows of what a film could be worth in a string of territories. If right. you take all the major territories in the world, they say the UK, it's worth between 100,000 on the low side and 250,000 on the high side. So the sales agent is engaged to do that. So the investor looks at the sales estimates and says, if I invest a million quid, will I get back my money? According to these sales estimates, on the low side, if I tot up all these territories, I get back a million point two. If it, if it sells better than that, you might get back three million. Now, they are estimates, and they are more, uh, the science behind them is limited. <laughs> so it, it is more, it, it literally is an estimate, because it depends on a number of factors. It depends on uh, how the film turns out. Remember, this is being done before the film is made. It depends who's in the film, and ultimately, it depends on factors like when your film is being sold, are there other films like that in the marketplace? Yeah. Uh, are there similar films? Which you may not be able to legislate against. So ultimately, you have to, uh, the sales agent has to take a view. And, um, and they tend to air, some are more conservative than others. Also, depending how much they want to get involved with the project, the estimates can be a bit more generous because they want to get your business. So that's at one stage that you, the sales agent can be involved. And what the sales agent does, you contract with the sales agent, they give you the estimates, and then when the film is being made, the sales company, the way I do it, because I represent films in individual territories, I tend to sell North America, the UK, Germany, Australia, a few other territories. And what I tend to, I like to do is to cut a promo of the film while it's in the editing process. Because you, and it's more than a trailer, because it's for the professional buyers. So it, you usually cut two promos, one of 
under two minutes and one of four minutes. The under two minutes is more of a conventional trailer uh, to give a feel of the movie. And the four minutes may show some sample scenes, gives an idea of the quality of the filmmaking, the quality of the performances, and how the film's actually panned out, uh, even though it's over a four minute sequence. These are for, these are not for the audience, the ultimate audience, but it's for the uh, sales agent to sell it in turn to the buyer in France, Portugal, Germany. And if you can show a trailer or the, the semblance of a trailer, how the film is, that in turn encourages the buyer in that territory to see how he can make a trailer and sell it to his audience in turn. And the other thing is, if you make a, well, I'm a fan of making the promo um, at this stage, is often you're selling the sizzle of the film. How, and because people haven't seen the whole film, they haven't seen the flaws in the film. They haven't seen, uh, uh, they haven't seen um, perhaps there's some weak points in the film. So th an, often a buyer may get enthused and may make up the gaps in his own imagination, which might not be there in the film. So right. you might be able to sell the film for a higher price. And if you get, the ideal is to get two, um, at least two buyers competing against each other in a territory. So then the price can go up. So you try that stage to sell it, and the sales agent does. And then ultimately, the film, the finished film, is shown at markets. So it's shown at, um, as I said, the Cannes, as well as a festival, has a whole commercial film selling market. The American film market is solely a commercial film selling market. Berlin has a festival and a commercial film selling market. Toronto has a festival the smaller commercial market. These are places where outside of the films being screened in the festival, films are screened for international buyers um, in a whole different environment. Just like in this cinema, people are going to see films. At Cannes, films have been shown to buyers and they're going in and out of films, but seeing different films, maybe spending 10 minutes in one, an hour in one, going to another film. So in that environment, Finnish films are being shown, as well as also in that environment, they're looking at promos, like I described, of yeah. films that are in course of production. So deals have been made, and buyers come to these markets to try and buy films. Sellers come to sell the films, so they are your sales agents. And um, the degree of success depends on how good the films are, um, how, what the requirements of particular bars are at a different time because a buyer might buy between 8 and 12 films a year for his territory. So if he's bought three horror films, he doesn't want any more horror films. If he's got uh, some thrillers, he doesn't want some thrillers. It depends what they're looking for to flesh out their schedule. And uh, one of the key elements is to have a relationship with these buyers so you know what they're looking for at any time. And that's what you're engaged in the sales agent for. And the sales agent takes a commission on the sales they make. And they also take the cost of the festivals, pretending all these things off the top. And one of the problems is, for you, the filmmaker, is trying to control <laughs> those costs. Yeah. Because obviously if a sales company represents six films at Cannes, one film does really well in terms of sales, five do not so well. Obviously, you know, the fear is that the cost of that festival going to Cannes, going to that market, is then put against your film, the successful yeah. one. And you have to contractually build in safeguards to try and make sure those costs are split more fairly than that. It sh they should be, but in practice they're not. And you have to be wary of that and you have to get reports from the sales companies uh, and so forth. And now there's sales companies are doing more and more online digitally selling in that way. So it's kept some of the cost down. But there's n ultimately, you know, if you go to Sundance, you have a film in Sundance, it's a very good environment for selling North America. So that's a festival. There's also some market screenings. And, but it, you don't get a lot of bars from the rest of the world attending Sundance. They attend there to buy for North America. So that's a strong environment to get a North American deal. And North American sale helps drive sales in other territories.
because the questions that a buyer, say a French or German buyer will ask is, of a British film is the following. What's it about? Who's in it? Have you sold the UK? Is it being distributed in the UK? Because they regard a sale in the UK as being um, evidence of the film's worthiness and strength. So if you haven't sold it in your home territory, that's not necessarily a good sign. And have you done a US deal? Because the perception is that a deal in the US with the attendant publicity, even if it's a, a smaller release, will, uh, will help drive international sales. And again, you have to realize that the buyers are dealing in a risk adverse environment. They're trying, they're trying, half the time they're trying not to buy something unless they're forced in a position they think, if I don't buy it, I'm going to miss out. So, so you, and the more re you have to give them more reasons to buy than reasons they have not to buy. That's, that tends to be it. So a UK, so I tend to try and do, get a UK sale secured on my films before the film's finished because it helps me sell it in other territories. And if you can get a US deal of any kind of magnitude, then that helps the sales too in the rest of the world. So right now, you mentioned, you touched very briefly there on sort of digital technologies, how that's changing film sales, obviously territories, and sort of there's the rise of new territories, like China, of course, is a massive ter mm. territory now. They'll re-edit films to make them more attractive for, to the Chinese territories. Uh, what are the changing trends, really, within film well, sales? It used to be China was not a market at all. Mm. Russia was not a market at all because it was perceived you would sell it for a nominal amount, a film for a nominal amount of there, and you wouldn't see any more. Now there has been, uh, and also in China there was a terrible problem with piracy, which they right. are cracking down on. Now um, it is possible to get more reasonable and decent numbers out of, well, Russia before the sanctions were applied. Now mm. it's back down again. But before the sanctions were applied, Russia was a fertile market. China is a much better market than it used to be, but you have to recognize that the potential cinema audience in uh, China is hundreds of millions, but you will not get anything representing that kind of money. Um, one thing I have known filmmakers do is get involved with possible Chinese deals early on, but there is, there's a lot of, uh, I'd say to filmmakers, you have to be very aware. There's a lot of people who talk about Chinese money, and it tends to be like the horizon. It disappears as you approach <laughs> right. it. So I would be very careful uh, about that. And it's the same thing. Generally speaking, this is a bit, bit of a generality, but there are a lot of financiers. If you're making a UK film, I would try and deal with people in the UK mm. for two reasons. Um, people in the UK, you can check them out easier, check out their background, their business, what they've done. Secondly, you can get hold of them easier because if you're having periods where you need answers, you need to communicate with them, it's much better than you can. The problem with um, uh, dealing, say, with the film industry in America, it's centered in Los Angeles. It's a long way away. There's a big time difference. And there is a multitude of sales companies and financiers in Los Angeles some of which are real, some of which are, um, disappear overnight, um, some of which are people who were under one guise and come under another. So it's quite, if you're trying, if you, and they all, uh, and one of the problems is that what they try and do, companies in Los Angeles, is they try and get a right to your project. I'm, you, I'm talking about the stage before it's made, the film's been, is a stage of being financed. And what they'll try and do is, take your project, acquire an option or rights over it, and then they'll try and sell it in turn to people over there. So they're not really financier. They're middlemen, yeah. but they're not the ultimate financier. So you have to be very aware that people may be leveraging your film for their own ends abroad. And then again, the problem in Los Angeles is you c and when, it, when you get radio silence, you can't get hold of them. So it's much easier to... M Unless you're working with somebody very established in LA, I would start off working with people in the, within the United Kingdom or, or Europe as well. Much like our earlier um, filmmaker studio, you've actually presumpt 
my next question, yeah. uh, which is brilliant. Uh, I'm just going to give everyone a peek behind the curtain here that we do actually send these questions out to the filmmakers beforehand to make sure they're okay with it. And Gareth, you submitted this one for me to read. How did Alan Neal persuade you to do this for nothing? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm glad. Yes. I put that question in. Yeah. <laughs> just, if there's, so really, if there's one piece of advice you, want, you, know, you could give to a filmmaker who wants to see their project take shape you know, from the script to the screen, hmm. What, what piece of advice would you give them? Uh, let me preface it by saying this. The, the, the good thing about film as a, an art form is that it is something you can make at various prices. If, if you and I want to make a television show, we have an idea for a TV show in the UK, there's only a few channels we can go to and companies, and they in turn have to go to commissioning editors of the channels. You go to BBC, Film, Channel 4, um, ITV, uh, maybe Sky. Mm. So once we've been to those people, that's it. We're not going to get our TV film made. With film, you can, there's a multitude of ways you can make it. You can make it by fi crowdfunding. You can make it by um, getting commercial lenders. You can set up inv enterprise investment schemes. You can and you can also make it at varying levels of price. You can make a film for a few, few tens of thousands, a few hundred thousand, or a couple of million. So the thing is, it's capable of making, it is possible to make a film, to physically make one. And I would suggest that you start off with a story that's either got a hook or an angle that you can bring in um, an actor. Or you make the film for a small budget and use that as your first calling card into the industry. Because the director who, who directed Jurassic World, his previous film was a low-budget sci-fi film yeah. you know, that maybe cost a few hundred thousand. So he made that massive leap between one film and another. And... Uh, that is the beauty. That is the beauty about the film business, that you can actually, you can be like Gareth Evans, you make monsters, and then suddenly you're doing Godzilla. Yeah. So uh, it doesn't happen for everyone, doesn't happen for many people, but it does happen. And between those two extremes, that example, there's people who start off making, like I did Guy Ritchie's first film, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. It took us three years to get that film made because... Believe it or not, there was a time in this country where people did not want to see UK gangster films. It you seems amazing. <laughs> it seems... And we made what was the first of this genre, which I think we didn't necessarily do the service to humanity. <laughs> but, but that was the first one of that breaking genre, which has been replicated too many times. So... Uh, another thing you should, uh, if you've got a new idea or a new concept and people are telling you it's not a good idea because it's new, that's a very good thing. Because the other thing you should try and do is, is to do something new. Don't repeat, don't try and copy something that's been done recently because when your film comes out, they'll have come out first. So you should try and be original. Right, well, thank you very much, Gareth. We're now going to go into our rip-off of James Lipton's programme, but it's fine because he stole it from someone else as well. <laughs> so, we're going to begin with, what's your favourite word? Favourite word? My favourite word is Freddy. Freddy? Yeah. <laughs> Why Freddy? That's the name of my dog. Oh! And what's your least favourite word? Um, squirrel. Squirrel? Yeah. Squirrel? Oh. <laughs> Freddy hates squirrels. Does he? <laughs> yeah. What turns you on? Um... Uh, I like, I like to work with, this is genuine, I like to have worked with a filmmaker, I like to f have finished a film, show it to a group of buyers, come, you know, at one of these forums, one of these festivals, and then if you have a bidding war and you sell it for really good money, it's the most exciting thing. It really is very, very exciting and very rewarding. So that turns me on. So what, presumably what turns you off then is when you go... And it's the exact process when nobody buys it. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought it would be. Exactly. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Uh, sound or noise do I love? Um, I, I like that little n noise that buyers make in their throat when you suggest a figure that's 
completely beyond their comprehension, but they know that they want the film. It's a kind of squeaking noise. It's quite nice. <laughs> and what sound or noise do you hate? Um, I don't like that keening noise that foxes make in the middle of the noise. Night. It's, it's really scary. Very it's a really nice. weird noise. It's like fun. nothing I've ever heard. Yeah. What's your favourite curse word? Um, Hmm. I have a phrase I like to use sometimes when I'm describing somebody or talking about something. Um, I, I sometimes, if, I'm, if you and I are dealing with somebody we find difficult, I sometimes say to you, um, rearrange the following three words, wanker, fucking useless. <laughs> so that's kind of, that's a phrase I like to use. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. And, um, if you could do any other profession beyond yours, what would it be? I, um, when I was young, uh, when I was a young teenager, I had two things I, wanted, I was interested in. I was interested in becoming an air traffic controller, mm. and I was also interested in becoming a pathologist. Oh. So any job that combines the two would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and what profession, under no circumstances, would you ever want to do? Corporate lawyer. Corporate lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> Talk Done it. Experience. Been there. Yeah. Finally, if heaven exists, you go, you go up and you meet St. Paul, what would you like him to say? Um, you should have seen Richard Dawkins' face a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Oh. Right, that's absolutely fantastic, Gareth. We're now going to open it up to the audience. So, any questions? Oh. Oh, one on the front row. Uh, hello, Gareth. Hello. hello. Um, what attracted you to being involved with Slow West? With what? Slow West, the film. I think I, your name was up as... Snow West? Slow, Slow West. Slow West. I'm, not, I'm not involved in Slow West. You are. You are. You're, you're down as accounts, Slow West? accounts producer, Gareth Jones. It must be another Gareth Jones. Really? Yeah. Oh, I was going to say... So that's did, an easy question. Nothing you, drew me to that film <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> it was a first-time director, and I wondered if you sensed it was going to be a big success. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> There, is a, there are a couple of Gareth Joneses around. Oh, so, right. yeah. Gareth, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I want you to sort of put on your legal hat now. I'm uh, curious about this uh, expansion. You, you touched on the uh, VOD market yes. and how it will eventually replace uh, DVDs and everything else. Uh, what rather concerns me is what sort of controls there are for the filmmaker who is actually selling the film or even the distributor how they get their money back from some of these VOD outlets. Because it seems yeah. to me that it's very difficult to track down what happens to a lot of the money that comes in on VOD. Well, I mean, you, you could say that about other media too. You know, it was yeah. the same with DVD. Um, what you have to start with is a, a proper contract with the VOD distributor. Um, because, in fact, one thing about VOD is because um, the money that the VOD company makes, say, Filmflex or the, the on-demand system of Sky, is that Sky pay you as they sell your film watch by watch by watch. So you can actually negotiate quite a good commission. You should be able to negotiate maybe 40% because they don't have much cost. As you, if you look at a DV, uh, sorry, a VOD channel, it just has those constantly running 30 second clips yeah. of now showing, now showing. Then it, and so and the other thing is, if your film should be able to be told in 10 words, so that comes up on the VOD platform as well. So uh, in fact, VOD should be one of the easier medium to track your money because there's not much expenses off the top of the VOD company. So if your film is watched a thousand times at four quid a pop, that's four thousand of revenue, you should be entitled to whatever your commission is, say forty percent of that. So you you have to do two things. You have to have a decent contract outlining all this with the um, VOD company. And then you have to be prepared, you have to have the right of audit of the company. So you have to have the right of audit to audit them at least once every two years and the right to go in and appoint an accountant to inspect their books. And right. the mere threat of that, they'll suddenly come back and say, oh, we made a bit of a mistake on the last statement. There's some more money that we owe you. 
just the threat of it will do it. So uh, it, a lot of time, the VOD companies and other distribution uh, channels get away with it because nobody really chases them up. Nobody really threatens to come after them. And if you do, they find money. And this is across the whole spectrum of rights, sadly. But it's incumbent on you as the licensor to uh, have the contract that enables you to put pressure on them. Thank you. Yeah, that's... I think we've got time for one more question. Um, hi, Gareth. Hi, love. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah, question. Um, Whenever you start working with a filmmaker, do you usually try and keep up with their future films? Like, if you sign with a filmmaker on one film, do you try and just kind of represent them as their entertainment lawyer from then on? Well, I, I, don't, act as, I don't act as a lawyer as such. I'm a acting as a, um, as a consultant for the financing and the sales. So. I will help them with certain aspects of doing their headline deals, but I always have them engage a lawyer to do the final contracts, uh, a lawyer in private practice. Um, uh, but yes, I certainly do, because it's a relationship and you want to stay with them, because if you've gone through the furnace of making the first film, hopefully you can help them with the next one and start a relationship. So a lot of my, uh, the people I work with, I've been working with for a number of years, so yes. Any more questions? Hello. Hello. Um, you spoke earlier about making films accessible and sometimes getting involved in the script writing stage. Can you give some examples of that? And yeah, um, I always it? tend to be involved at the screen, at the screenplay stage because I, I'm not, I'm not a person that people bring films to after they've. Um, made them or started production. So they may have a screenplay, and then I look at the screenplay and see if there's um, some things that can help it to make it more saleable. Uh, if you take example of Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, when I read the screenplay, uh, it's got you know, maybe 20 characters in it. It's quite difficult to read on the page and keep track of what's going on. It's completely different when you're watching a film and you see the individual characters. So when Guy Ritchie wrote it, he had three characters named in the screenplay. One was J, J-A-Y. One was J, just J, and one was Joe. And you had no, <laughs> and I said to him, I have no idea who these people are or what they're doing. And imagine somebody who's French reading this, <laughs> right? So we did kind of, simple, that's just a simple example of how, and then he changed the names to be radically distinct names. So that, that helped. And that screenplay went through a number of changes. It was, it was even more convoluted than it is now. Um, and uh, I also, when my buyers were reading it before the film was made, I also told them, and I do this with a number of screenplays, that they have to read it in one sitting. Anything complicated, you have to read, you have to get the buyers to read it in one go because a film like Lockstock is just too complicated to put it down and pick it up a week later. So um, things like that. I'm, I've always got an awareness of how somebody's going to read this maybe in a different language or when it's a finished film, how they're going to see it. It, it, it. There's lots and lots of different things, but sometimes there's things that just jump out like that example that I think uh, that needed to change. I was also involved in the film Secretary with Maggie Gyllenhaal. And it was called The Secretary. It was originally from a piece of work called Secretary. Then it was called The Secretary. And I thought The Secretary sounds like a bit of a horror film or a, you know, you know, because there is a film called The Temp about a crazy temp. So, so I said it sounds more enigmatic to call it Secretary. So we went back to calling it Secretary, and it won most original film at Sundance. And I think just simply as, just by even by dropping that definitive, made the film to be something slightly different in perception than otherwise. So think there's all sorts of tricks like that, but you need to address them at the screenplay stage. Uh, it can be hard later on. Is that for questions anymore? Can't see because of the lights. No. Oh no, I think, I, okay. think, I think that's it. Well, thank you, Gareth. Gareth Jones, everyone.